Well, good morning. This is, uh, rem- uh, makes me think of those days in the spring on college campus, you know, the professor would say, let's just have the class outside. Boy, what wonderful weather we got. Uh, we should be meeting out on the parking lot. This is fabulous after what we went through this past summer. Uh, I got a text this morning from Seth Thatcher. Notice he's not here. Uh, I'm wearing my cowboy tie. And uh, uh, Seth, who always puts everybody in their proper place, uh, texted me and said that uh, he won't be here. He's going to the cowboy game. And I said... uh, (laughs) I said, now, let me, let me get this straight. Mike Black or the Cowboys? The Cowboys or Mike Black? And I keep losing that every time over the years. Um, but uh, one day, maybe I'll win. Uh, but Seth is, uh, I, as I told him, Seth, I really... I appreciate you so much. I don't even I don't come anymore for the exposition. I come to hear you make the announcements. <laughs> we are in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 2. And Samuel said, "How can I go when Saul hears? He will kill me." And the Lord said, Take a heifer and say, To sacrifice to the Lord I have come. I want you to look at this verse 3. Be real sensitive in your reading in Bible study. I want you to look at the U's and the I's. Just be sensitive in what's the repetition as it goes on. And you shall invite Jesse to the feast, for I myself will let you know what you should do, and you shall anoint for me the one I tell you. Just read it with sensitivity, and you see what's going on. And Samuel did what the Lord told him and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Are you coming in peace? And he said, In peace, to sacrifice to the Lord I have come. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the feast. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the feast. Now, here is our second key word in the passage, verses 6 and 7. Pay attention to the repetition of the word. Robert Alter, who is not a Christian, is a Jewish scholar. He has written a magnificent piece of work in the Old Testament. And he says, don't get carried away with your English translation. Watch what the Lord is doing and so I am going to translate it as he would recommend. And you can see the force. And they came and saw. That's our first key word. Saw, from the verb to see. Eliab, Eliab. And thought, surely the one before the Lord is his anointed. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not see. See his appearance or his height, for I have, there's our first key word we saw last time, rejected him, for my way of seeing is not like man's way of seeing. For, that's to explain, man sees by the eyes, but the Lord sees by the heart. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, six times that verb is used before us in those last two verses. This is lesson three, the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. Last time in our lesson, you can recall, if you were here, we raced across the pages of Holy Scripture from 1535 all the way to 161. And if you missed last time, you can see by looking, you really missed nothing. We focused in our last lesson on the spiritual landscape of the times, the people previous to when our study began, ask Samuel for a king. And boy, did they get one. Wow. Uh, the request for a king triggered our first key word in the story, and we looked at that word rejection. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, the Lord said to His prophet, the people have not rejected you, but rather have rejected me. And that's exactly what Samuel took to the people. First Samuel 10, 19, today you have rejected your God. They wanted a replacement for Him. A something instead of. That's what the word rejected and the force of it means. So here's the essence of the people's rejection. 1 Samuel 8, 6, give us a king like all the other nations. And that is contrasted for us in chapter 16 and verse 1, right here. The Lord's words to our prophet, a king for me, says the Lord. So there we have this plan, and that is our verb to send, right here. 16.1. Now, this is not a new plan. This is not a, if that doesn't work, then we'll do this. No, it, that, this is the Lord we're talking about here. We know that it's not a new plan. 1 Samuel 15, 35. He, the Lord, has a plan. A one plan. And He will accomplish that one plan because He is effective to doing His will on both the earth and in heaven. So what is Saul? How do we explain Saul? Well, we explain him by that anthropomorphism in 1535, the word regretted, applying a human term to an eternal God. Uh, Saul's failure alters nothing about God's plan. Saul is a demonstration of the people's heart. And that's what the Lord wanted to show them. Now, our lesson for today, the, uh, the second key word in the text, the verb to see. My goal, my aim today is that you won't leave this class without being able to see as the Lord sees. That's the goal. Beginning in verse 2. And Samuel said, How can I go when Saul hears he'll kill me? The context is the bold calling of the plan that God is putting him through. And Samuel here and the elders of Bethlehem, they reverberated through this plan with fear. They didn't know what was up, but fear was certainly caused by the prophet showing up at Bethlehem. And we understand Saul's known for his instability, his outbursts of anger. Proverbs 19.12, you remember Proverbs, don't you? Um, 19.12, the temper of a king is like the roar of a lion. 
I have no problem with the prophet's fear. Uh, it's real easy in the confines of the adult Sunday school class at Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, to denounce this great man as being weak need, lacking faith. That's because this is a comfortable place. But we don't live here. We meet here. We live out there. And out there is a scary place. And the path of providence has lots of twists and turns and dark places and a lot of loss and suffering. And so, no, I, I don't have a problem whatsoever with this man's fear. He accommodates his fear. Take a heifer and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, which is a half-truth. And I have no problem with a half-truth. Look, he's, no, he's not under any obligation to tell anybody anything except what the Lord had told him. Now that's very meaningful to me. I had a Hebrew professor. And if I heard him say one time, I heard him say 20 times, that based upon the number of applications, your seat occupies 11 applications to this education. Ergo, you better be in Christian ministry and service when you leave this institution. Well, what did I do? I went to work for Dallas Power and Light Company. I was making $12,200 a year and I'd never seen so much money in all my life. Look, my Bible reads what your Bible reads. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 3. You're not to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. This prophet of God answers to the Lord alone. I could take you to the place that I sat across from S. Lewis Johnson. And this subject came up about a year, year and a half after I had graduated. And he gave me one of those looks. I'll never forget that look. I know you're dull, but you just broke the sound barrier. Um, and he said, you don't answer to those men down there on Swiss Avenue. That was my professor's. You answer to the Lord. You're a servant of the Lord. You know what we do here under the elders of Believer's Chapel? We treat you like believer priests that you are. That's what we do. We treat you like mature people in the Scriptures. Verse 3, this is a ziva, a ritual act of feast. You shall invite Jesse and literally... I will let you know what you shall do. Now, I know you organizers, and I know you planners, uh, and I have so much respect and appreciation for you. You have everything planned out. I went to Larry Hairston's mother's funeral, and he described her as the gold standard, a place for everything and everything in its place. And I respect that and appreciate that. But listen, that's not the Christian life. The Lord takes us all kinds of places, up and around. You, you think a roller coaster or something. We all know we've, we've walked with the Lord long enough. You can't plan for what's happening to you. And look what He has done to show you all the twists and turns that He has been there all along the way for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, We walk by faith and not by sight. 
And specifically here, you shall anoint for me the one who I tell you. Look at those final words, tell you. When the time comes, you will know. I want to know now. Tell me now. That's not the Christian life. You'll know at the proper time to know. In Luke chapter 12, verse 4, our Lord said, they're going to bring you up before the magistrates of the synagogue, but don't worry about what to say. You don't have to write out anything in advance because the Spirit of God will be with you then. Two weeks ago when I was here, I sat down across from a young man in the ministry and, uh, and he needed to talk to me. And after about 20 minutes, I got my brain around why he wanted to talk to me. And uh, I, I just interrupted him. I said, what time is on your watch? Time? No, it's 7.35. I said, well, you wanting to discuss with me 6.30, 6.45, 7 o'clock tonight. You're not there. I'm not there. You don't know what God's going to do with you and how He's going to work in your life. So let's just take it one day at a time and walk faithfully with Him. Verse 4, and Samuel did what the Lord told him. You know, I brag on these guys that I meet with um, year after year, Friday morning, 6.30 in Oklahoma City. They are so bright. Uh, and I'm the dummy in the room. They all have advanced degrees. Uh, this one guy was a mathematics major and he's starting his own insurance company and just killing it. Um, and I sat down across from him and he said, let me show you my formula. My eyes just crossed. I mean, they're just brilliant guys. And, uh, and I'm always challenged by how do I bring the Scriptures home to people that are so much more talented than I ever am. I came to verse 4 and I, I asked them this question. I said, uh, does anybody have any idea what uh, Samuel made on his aptitude scores? Uh, LSAT, MedCab. How, how many degrees did he have? How successful was he? in transacting business? How much money did he have in the bank? Does anybody have the slightest idea? They all looked at me. I said, yet this man, he walks across the pages of this book like a colossus. And he casts a long, deep shadow over the Old Testament. And you come to verse 4, and guys, here it is. This is the key to his success. Here it is. And he did what the Lord told him. Do that. And you'll live a great and powerful life. 1 Corinthians 4.2 What is required of you and me is to be a servant. A servant. So the prophet arrives, verse 10, verse 5, and he puts the elders at ease. Notice the word peace is repeated twice. He consecrates Jesse and his sons and invites them to the feast. Uh, consecration probably is a reference to Exodus 19:10, where Israel in the wilderness consecrated themselves by washing their clothes. So here we are now to the heart of our lesson, verses 6 and 7, to see. To see. We say, what do you see? 
we say, what does he or her see in them? My wife and I occasionally will watch a, one of those twisted, turning mysteries, murders, solve the murder. And 30, 40 minutes into this show, she goes, oh! And I grab the changer and stop the show. Oh, what? Oh, what? Don't you see? No. No, no, I don't see. I don't see. And it irritates me. She's too smart for me. John 4.35 Our Lord said, Open your eyes and see the fields. They're ripe for harvest. I'm just looking out there and seeing the field. In order to understand the passage, we need to see like he sees. John the Baptist was the forerunner to our Lord, the King. And he's the, he's the announcer for the King. And he's over here in prison, Herod's prison. And he asked the logical question. If you're the King, bringing the kingdom, why am I in here? I should be out there with you. And he sends his disciples out to ask that question. And our Lord answers. And then he turns to the people. And he says, What did you come out to see when you heard John preaching at the Jordan? You and I very much need to see like God sees. So here we are in Bethlehem. The sage is set. All the people are there. Their clothes are washed. The ziva is going on. And Samuel sees Jesse come with these boys. And he thought, ah, isn't the Lord great? Isn't He wonderful? Look at these good-looking group of men that surround Him. Broad shoulders, smartest whips. Here's Eliab. And that's our first word, rejected. Something instead of. The Word of God breaks into His thoughts. Do not see. Height, stature. Why, he's got a John Wayne jaw. My, this guy is unbelievable. Verse 7. And God gives us His instruction. And here it is. See that four? That is going to explain to us how to see. My way of seeing is not man's way of seeing. God goes right through that flesh and that bone, and He looks right into the depths of the heart. And in doing that, what does God see? Now, this is one of those passages in Scripture where exegeting the text, going through the words, scrubbing them down, really does no good. And the context doesn't help us either because we're still bewildered by this issue of seeing. So how are we going to interpret this text? We have to 
We have to bring our theology to bear like a giant lamp over this text to help us in order to understand what God is saying. So let's do it this way. Let's ask this question. When God looked down upon this, the sons of Jesse, what did he not see? Not see. Well, what he did not see is looking at David and saying, wow, there's a godly man. There's, there's a righteous man in Israel right there. I see him. And we know that that didn't happen because godly men don't exist unless God makes you godly. There's no one righteous. No, not one. No one is good unless God makes them good. God must work in the heart first in order for righteousness to be obtained. Oh, that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's what Paul tells us in the New Testament. No. It's what Moses told you in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 7.7 7. It was not because you were more numerous than the other people that the Lord set His love on you and choice of you. For you were the fewest. In other words, you weren't the logical choice. The Romans were better than you. The Greeks were better than you. And that's why Paul picks it up in 1 Corinthians 1.27 and says that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God, Paul says, takes the weak. God, Paul says, takes the insignificant. And what does he do? He makes them powerful. That's how he shames them. He makes them powerful. His power in you. His power in me. It's God's power. So, when I am with you, you encourage me. You bless me. You build me up. And you know what's going on? As you exude that to me, it's the beauty of Jesus Christ in you. Little shards and pieces of Christ. That's how you build me up. And it's beautiful. No, not, not Vogue beautiful. No, Christ! Christ is the most attractive person. I had a friend that's now standing in the presence of the Lord. He said, you take a room about this size. It wouldn't make any difference if it were a union hall or it was a black tie event. And you bring Jesus Christ in and it will not be long before He'll be the only voice talking in the room. Why? Because He's captivating and He is incredibly beautiful. That's attractive. The beauty that the world cannot possibly imitate. And that is the power of Christ in you. The Apostle says in Ephesians 2.10, we're His workmanship 
created in Christ. His fingerprints are all over you. That's what He is doing in you, through you. Had setbacks? Had diversions? Had dark places? Look how He's treated you. What's He doing? Destroying you? No. He's making you. And you are better for it. And we are the beneficiaries of knowing you. So, you show me a picture of your father, you show me a picture of your grandfather, and I say, oh, yeah, I see the family resemblance, of course. Yeah. And that's what you do. The resemblance of Christ in you. That's, that's what He sees. But from a chronological standpoint, we've got to interpret the passage. And so let's do that right here. In space and time, somewhere, someplace along the way, this little shepherd boy believed. He understood the revelation that he was given and he believed. And he trusted the living God in that moment. Now, we know that because later on, the prophet speaks to him regarding the Davidic covenant. And he gives him kind of a, an overall thumbnail sketch of his history. And here is the way it is described. 2 Samuel 7, 8, and 9. God said, I took you from the pasture following the flock. I took you. I took you. You didn't take yourself. You don't have any ability to take yourself. I took you. Following the flock. And then he says, I have been with you wherever you have gone. You know what that is? That's fellowship. That's the Emmaus travelers walking with Jesus. Hearts burning, carrying the word. That is friendship. That is fellowship with the living God. And so when God says, my plan is for Israel to have a king, He's going to be my king. Not an ordinary king. My king. A king with a relationship with me. So, let's take the last few minutes and focus upon seeing. Because like I said, I desperately need to learn how to see like the Lord sees. I was listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones back in 1966. Him delivering a lecture. And I'm going to incorporate his thoughts now into our text. He is asking, essentially, how do you differentiate the things of man and the things of God? And so, here's what he said. He said, you know it's the work of man if you can explain it. I see the work of man. Yeah. It's all self-explanatory. Sure. Yeah, got it. Right? And so Saul is a foot and a half taller than all the other men. He'll be great to go out there and face Goliath, right? No. No. Not his skin. Um, 
But here is the sons of Jesse, verse 8. Here's Aminadab, Abinadab. And here's Shama. They're, they're perfect for the part, right? And they've got all the look. That's as man sees. Not how the Lord sees. What Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if you want to see like the Lord sees, what you see cannot be explained. Cannot. Here's your illustration. Acts 2.2. 2. They're at Solomon's portico, day of Pentecost. And the Scriptures say, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, rushing mighty wind, and the men saw, saw, what appeared to be tongues of fire resting on the disciples' heads. And here's what the, here's what the narrative says in Acts 2, that the people were bewildered. They were amazed. They were perplexed. And they shouted out, what does this mean? You see it. If you can explain it, it's of men. But if you can't explain it, it's the Lord. Explain Saul of Tarsus. He's down the Damascus Road. He's going to incarcerate. He's going to kill those Christians. He's going to deal with this once and for all. What happened? What happened? You know, when I came to Christ in 1972, I lost every friend I had. All my companions deserted me. Why? Because I was different. I was different. You see it and can explain it, then it's of man. You see it and can explain it, it's of God. Here's the second thing that will help you. Man is passive, not active. God is active. Man is passive. The Apostle Paul was a brilliant man. Heck, God gave him one of these giant brains. And uh, he had a great education to go along with that giant brain. And that's the New Testament, what we are learning. Uh, so the Apostle Paul goes to Corinth, and he's going to take that giant brain with that wonderful education, and he's going to take Christ to those people in Corinth, right? No. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come as someone superior in speaking wisdom and proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. And I did it for one reason, said the Apostle. So that you wouldn't say, gosh, if I just was smart as he was, or if I just had that Harvard degree, or I had gone to Princeton like my dad wanted me to, no, Paul said. None of that. It's a demonstration of Christ and His power. That's why He did it. Not by might. What is that? Man's might. Not by power. That is man's power. But by my Spirit, said the Lord. So, I conclude this way. What do you see? Well, uh, if you're in Bristol, England, in the 1800s, what you see are these Christians that are 
working night and day, seven days a week, and not going to church. And your pastor, your local pastor, George Mueller, is meeting with you and he's imploring, please come to church. It'll in real will refresh you. It will build you up. But they said, no, I got to get ahead. Hey, fellas, in business, you got to get ahead. You got that? You got to get ahead. Don't ask the question, get ahead of what? Just get ahead. And Mueller said, that's when God put it in my mind. Right then. Snapped it right there. I'm going to demonstrate to them that God can do more for them than they can ever do for themselves. He wasn't interested in building orphans' homes. He had come to pastor. But they had all these orphans. And they became the tool to demonstrate that. So what did Mueller do? He said, I'm reading the Scriptures, Psalm 68, verse 5, I am father to the fatherless. I'm going to believe God and I'm going to take Him in His Word. Therefore, I am not going to ask anyone for anything to build these orphans' homes. I'm going to pray. And He did. And He kept it all right here. And people start giving Him money. Unexplainable. People start giving Him money. And that's how it all began. Up here is a brand new book, a brand new publication. The book's 20, 25 years old. Roger Steer, Delighted in God, the story of George Mueller. If you don't get one, tell me I'll get you one. What is the power of God? You can't explain it. Men stay passive to it, and God does the work. And according to the Apostle Paul, the world is confounded by it. Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, where did he come from? How did he get there? by the power of God and by the prayers of people that care about this country and have asked God to be merciful to it. My friends, you want to see like God sees? Then watch what man can't do. Watch what can't be explained and you will see God right there in that instance for His own glory. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for our elders and the deacons and the men who are here to serve us, the gifted men that teach us all the time. Encourage us. Thank you for the friendship and fellowship that we have one to another. The power of Christ in and through each and every one of us. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, for all you have done and will continue to do. In Jesus' name, Amen.